Welcome to Texas Art Institute educational programs on innovative technologies and techniques. My name is Von Krasier. I'm an interventional cardiologist at Texas Heart Institute and Baylor CHI Medical Center. The topic today is coarctation and its management. These are best handled with endovascular therapy. Coarctation treatment, as far as indications and options are concerned, there are particular indications that are necessary to consider any kind of intervention on patients with this condition. The most important one is decrease in luminal diameter of more than 50% at the coarctation site and a pressure gradient across the coarctation of more than 20 millimeters of mercury. There are several options obviously available as far as treatments are concerned. And one is surgery with a variety of options such as patch, repair, subclavian flap, end-to-end -end anastomosis with uh, uh, suture-based uh, technique and uh, bypass with a variety of conduits. Endovascular approach uh, includes balloon angioplasty, the use of various kinds of stents, and stain grafts. I would like to share with you uh, some of the complications, particularly late complications after surgical treatment of coarctation. Aneurysms have been frequently reported after patch repair, but also after subclavian flap and end-to-end -end anastomosis and also bypasses. As we can see here on this image, uh, formation of a pseudoaneurysm at the site of previous surgical repair. The overall incidence of aneurysms and pseudoaneurysms after surgical repair is somewhere in the range of 10%. After subclavian flap repair is slightly higher, it's 17%. After dacron patch repair is even higher and it ranges in the literature between 5 to 38%. And after the use of tube graft repair, somewhere in the range of 6%. What's very important is the overall aneurysm rupture risk is roughly at 7% in the literature. There are numerous advantages of endovascular techniques for coarctation repair. Number one, it's a less invasive procedure. It has less complications. Uh, it offers early recovery with excellent procedural and also long-term results. There are a variety of techniques available. One of the older ones is a plain old balloon angioplasty, which is nowadays rarely used and is typically used in infants and children. But more frequently now we're using stents of various kinds. Uh, one of the older ones is Palmas XL stents that are either 30 millimeters in length or 40 millimeters in length or 50 millimeters in length and they can dilate from 10 millimeters all the way up to 30 millimeters in diameter. And then more recently there are a variety of stent grafts available. One of the earliest one was ICAST but now there are several other ones which are balloon expandable but also we have several self-expanding stents uh, grafts that are being used for this particular condition. Forbes and the co-workers uh, reported in the catheterization and cardiovascular intervention in 2007 their uh, multi-institutional study on procedural results and acute complications in stenting native and recurrent coarctation of the aorta in patients over four years of age. This was a retrospective review from 1989 to 2005 that involved 17 institutions. 565 procedures were performed in 555 patients, median age of 15 years. The procedures were performed in native uh, coarctation without uh, previous surgery or intervention in 52% of patients. In recurrent surgical uh, coarctation, about 40% of patients and recurrent uh, post-intervention coarctations in 7% of patients. What is important is that their procedural success rate was close to 
percent. However, aortic wall complications occurred in 3.9 percent of patients that included either dissection or perforation with extravasation. Here is the literature review related to endovascular coarctation repair from uh, several studies. The first one by Thanopoulos that was published in the Journal of American College of Cardiology in 2008 included 46 patients with a mean age of 33 years and uh, follow-up in months for 60 months. Uh, this uh, particular study reported on the use of a Palma stent for uh, treatment of coarctation. Their technical success was 100%, and we can see that the gradient uh, before the intervention was 58 millimeters of mercury, and it was reduced to 6.5 millimeters of mercury after the successful procedure. The other reports that are listed here all included the use of a variety of stent grafts, such as Optimate or Sinus Aorta stent, Endofint stent graft, and Talent and Valiant stent grafts. And you can see, again, the technical success rate is very high. It was higher in Schnabel's uh, uh, publication and Botha's publication than in uh, Haji uh, Zainali publication. And again, as we can see, there is a dramatic reduction in the gradient after the use of stent grafts for correctation repair. I would like to share with you some, our, some of our personal experience related to endovascular interventions for treatment of coarctation. The first case that I would like to share with you was a 34-year-old male with exertional shortness of breath and malignant hypertension. His physical examination revealed uh, elevated blood pressure in left and right arm of 180 over 90 millimeters of mercury with excellent uh, brachial pulses but no femoral or dorsalis pedis or posterior tibial pulses. As we can see here on the left side images, uh, there was a very severe coarctation present uh, after the origin of the left subclavian artery. And on the right sided image, we can see the intravascular ultrasound image that shows a lot of calcium and also fibrosis and the severe narrowing uh, at the site of uh, the coarctation prior to the intervention. This information uh, showed uh, the interventional uh, procedure. As we can see here, uh, the approach was a percutaneous femoral artery access. We pre-closed the access site with 10 French Prostar XL and then advanced the 11 French sheath that was 75 centimeter long and measured the gradient across the coarctation, which was 79 millimeters of mercury. We then performed balloon angioplasty with 15 millimeters in diameter and 40 millimeters long non-compliant balloon, and then deployed a Palmas XL stent that was 40 millimeters in diameter to uh, 16 millimeters uh, in diameter, as we can see here, and uh, we achieved uh, the total evaluation of the gradient that was 79 millimeters of mercury before the intervention to no gradient at the end of the procedure. And uh, the procedure was successful without complications. The femoral artery was repaired at the end of the procedure and the patient was discharged from the hospital on the post-operative day one. A two-year follow-up on the right-hand side, we can see a 3D CTA image with excellent results and uh, this patient continued to do well and actually his arterial hypertension was significantly improved on long-term follow-up. Case number two that I would like to share with you is a patient that had a developed pseudoaneurysm post-surgical coarctation repair as we can see here on the CT images showing very narrow uh, area at the site of residual coarctation and also a presence of a pseudoaneurysm. This was a 32-year-old male that uh, had a, a repair at an early age elsewhere. And uh, uh, this procedure was done with a Dacron graft material. We can see during the intervention 
The uh, angiogram in the middle frame shows the uh, presence of a pseudoaneurysm in very uh, narrowed uh, segment where coarctation occurred. There was a severe gradient of uh, 60 millimeters of mercury across the coarctation. And then on the right-hand side, we can see that this particular patient was treated with a thoracic stem graft that measured 24 millimeters in diameter, proximally and distally, and it was 160 millimeters in length. The gradient was completely abolished, and there was no evidence of any endoleak uh, or flow to the pseudoaneurysm. This patient was uh, also discharged uh, on post-operative day number one without complications, and he continued to do well on a long-term follow-up. The third patient that I would like to share with you is more complex than the other previously discussed patients. This uh, patient was a 30-plus-year-old uh, patient that was referred to us from another country, and he had a, a coarctation repair surgically elsewhere at the age of six. We can see here on uh, the CT images um, and also on the schematic uh, uh, rendering uh, that this procedure was done surgically with a small 10 millimeter tube graft that the hist in the distal segment and there was a formation of a large pseudoaneurysm in the distal part uh, distally to the coarctation. This procedure was uh, performed uh, again via percutaneous approach and local anesthesia using a suture immediate closure device. We used the uh, uh, anurex uh, limb uh, for this uh, particular problem uh, and also uh, gore uh, tag uh, stand graft uh, that were uh, overlapped uh, in the, the existing uh, tube graft to resolve and address the problem of pseudoaneurysm and also dissection. He also had coil embolization of uh, that pseudoaneurysm. As we can see, uh, the final uh, angiogram, completion angiogram shows excellent result and no evidence of endoleak. The patient was discharged the following day. And here we can see a 12-year follow-up uh, CTA, again with excellent results and the patient is asymptomatic and uh, there is no evidence of any endoleak at the previous pseudoaneurysm. Uh, we have also at our institution looked at our uh, long-term experience uh, as far as uh, coarctation repair is concerned, where more than 900 coarctations were performed over a longer period of time. And we can see here that uh, 55 patients uh, developed uh, aneurysms after a surgical repair at long-term follow-up. We can see that uh, coarctation was still re present in a significant number of patients as shown here and required not only treatment of coarctation but also a treatment of formation of the aneurysm. Here we can see here that the patients uh, underwent open surgical repair in almost 80% uh, of cases, and 11 patients or 21% of patients had endovascular repair. Now, as far as the results are concerned, 30-day mortality uh, was close to 2% with surgical repair, and uh, neurological deficit occurred in 5.7% of patients. And uh, uh, as we can see, uh, Paraparesis uh, occurred in 1.9% of patients. Significant number of patients also had respiratory complications, such as 11.3% that required prolonged ventilation, and 3.8% of patients required tracheostomy. Acute renal insufficiency was present in 5.7% of patients, and vocal cord paralysis occurred in almost 21% of patients, and 7.5% of patients required reoperation for bleeding and the median uh, hospital stay was uh, uh, seven days with a range between six to nine days. When we compare this with our experience uh, in this particular population, 11 patients that were treated via endovascular approach, we can see that uh, 
mean range was, uh, age was 39 percent, length of follow-up was 40 months, and devices that we used were TAG, Thoracic by Gore, and Talent by Medtronic. Uh, there were no uh, morbidities occurring in this particular group of patients, zero mortality, and zero need for re-intervention. So on the basis of our experience and experience of others, we can see significant advantages of endovascular treatment of coarctation. Majority of patients can be treated with good immediate and long-term results. This particular approach avoids extensive thoracic surgery and other aggressive measures that are inherent with surgery. re aneurysms and pseudoaneurysms can be successfully treated with various commercially available stent grafts. Local anesthesia, percutaneous approach, and outpatient procedure lowers cost and offers good long-term results. Balloon expandable stents or stent grafts are preferable to the technique of plain old balloon angioplasty. Redo intervention is also possible at low risk and good results uh, whenever this is necessary. Thank you very much for your attention.